<laughs> I'm here with Jerry Lewis, the one and only Jerry Lewis, my idol. And uh, if I should pass away now, it would be okay. <laughs> Jerry, JM. Yeah, baby. Um, as a kid, you told me a great story about the first time you, you heard applause and, and it was like, you know, heroin, I guess. <laughs> well, at five years old, we're not supposed to remember at five years old. And I talked to some of the brilliant doctors in the world in the last 77 years, proclaiming, <clears throat> I got to tell you about when I was five. And I tell them a whole a menu of what happened from the time my dad found out if he put me in the show, they'd get 10 bucks more. Because mom and dad <laughs> were getting $25 to do the gig. With the kid, he'd get 10 more. So at five, my mom made me a tux. She made you a tux. A kid in a tux at five years old, you don't have to do a lot. You know, it, <laughs> you're almost a hit immediately. Right. Now if the kid remembers the lyrics to a song, they may give you 10 more. Right. And I sang, Brother Can You Spare a Dime? <laughs> I'm five years old and I'm singing of the depressed state of the world. Give me a year. Once I built well, a rail. A year? You know how old I was? Yeah, it was 19, 1931. 1931, height of the Depression. Oh, God. Once I built a railroad, made it run, made it race, race against, against time. time. Once oh. I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? <laughs> Well, I finished the number, and the applause was unbelievable, but I took my bow, and my foot slipped into the footlight and broke the bulb, and the smoke and the noise scared me so desperately that my dad held me, and I was hanging on for life, and I never heard such a laugh from an audience. They thought it was a bit? I haven't had one since. Yeah. <laughs> they thought it was a bit. Yeah. They just responded naturally. Uh -huh. What audience wouldn't go, is that cute? Cute, look at the band. <laughs> I, got, I came back the next Saturday and got 15. And when you worked by yourself, on your own, without, yeah. without your folks, do you remember your first gig? Oh, sure. And was it, it wasn't, was it the 500 Club? No. Was the Miami Club was when Dean and I got together. Right, you know, in Atlantic City. go back City. five, six years. So, the, but the first gig the you first, had by yourself. The first time by myself, I was getting $135 a week to play in the burlesque house in Toronto. That's a lot the of money. The casino theater, $135. In those days? You bet. Uh, I said, you go alone. In Toronto? Well, yeah. Hi. And I was on after the stripper and before the sketch. Because I did a record act. Need no music, need no light, need nothing. Just spot them and let them go. Right. So everything could be prepared backstage while I'm doing my 16 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching the guys in the front row with, the, with their coats going like that. You know, a tough, to, tough room. <laughs> <laughs> what were the songs you did? I remember you did, you ate crackers and did opera. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I did Lago El Factor, Barbara Seville, with a gray fright wig uh -huh. and, and, a, and a, a black cake that got my way and into my mouth. And I timed it so that I was sucking the cape at the right time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And the laugh was there. But I thought I was so unique with this novel act until I found out that, God, it was done maybe 100 years before in England. The record act. Yeah, oh, sure. Mouthing words to pretty start. pretty good when, performers. When did you make the transition from uh, uh, what we call a record act to uh, departing from that and doing other other things? At the Havana Madrid, when I was playing there, uh, Dean was booked in for two weeks, and I did my act, and then came off, and then production number, and then they introduced Dean, and Dean did three or four songs, and then I went to work on them. And we had the best fun for four weeks. I was out of that record, I was into live animation yeah, and yeah. crazy sounds, and I was a head waiter, I was a busboy, I was a lady with a wig, whatever it took to get him laughing. The first, And that's how it started, really. The first time, I think, was... Dean was singing, yeah. and 
you spontaneously, without his knowledge, came out with a tray and started spilling. It was that the first time? And then Dean saw this, your, the anarchy of you and, and how the laugh, and he kind of, I think you described to me that he gave this kind of knowing smile where, hey, this is okay. Or, yeah. That was like a seminal moment in the relationship. He made, he made me very comfortable to go for whatever I wanted to do. And everything worked. It was incredible. You um, also had a great relationship with Stan Laurel. Oh, yeah. Okay. And you told me a great story that you wanted him to be a script doctor or give you notes. And the only thing, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, you would get a script back from him. First of all, he didn't want any money. And you wanted no, he wouldn't take any. He was living in a little apartment in Santa Monica. Right. But Very proud man. Yes. And he wrote on your scripts, this, tell me, don't do this. He only told you what not to do. Right. Don't do this. Don't shoot this. Talk to me about that. Uh -huh. And every negative instance never got to the film. I would right. never go against what he said. Mm -hmm. Even if, if he had marked that on a hunk I really loved, it would never have been shot. Really? I had that regard for him. His, his genius and his sense of comedy. Mm -hmm. My God. He and Ali had what Dean and I had. A couple of different levels. But they loved each other. They oh, Like you and Dean. Absolutely. Because a lot of comedy teams didn't like each other. Who? As, as we know. Well, Evan Costello. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, you know, and, I never could understand. Bob how, and do you, how do you make funny with someone that you dislike so much? I never could understand how that worked. But it worked for years because Bud and Lou didn't talk off stage. No, they hated each other. There was a different dynamic, though. Their, their comedy was kind of soulless. Yeah. And that's not a put down. No, I know that. It was very mechanical, whereas you and Dean had this passionate, emotional thing that was going on. It was amazing. You know, if, if, some, if some father gave as much love to their children as Dean and I gave one another when we were just in the room, it would make such a terrific world. When you directed your first film, yeah, which was? Bellboy. Bellboy. Tell the story about the deal you had with the studio. Mm -hmm. You had another, I'll set it up for you, you had another picture coming out. It wasn't coming out for a while. And you had some time. Mm. Tell this, this is a great, a great story. I go to New York to talk to Paramount about Cinderella, which was a film that I had wanted for Christmas, for family. Mm -hmm. And when I started to write, I was writing with Frank Tashlin to do Cinderella. I wanted to make it a project that was family oriented and I wanted it to be a, a Christmas release. I directed everything at that. Mm -hmm. The 12 inch disc, the colored shades on that recording of the music of the film that a child can hold the baton and put the music stand up and conduct the music and all the things that were relative to Cinderella and it was going to be a wonderful family Christmas thing. So mm -hmm. I sit down with Barney Ballard and he said, Jerry, I have to tell you, we, we're gonna, we're gonna, we need a Jerry movie in the summer. I said, you've had a Jerry movie in the summer for a long time. Yeah, but we have, we, we want to move Cinderella to the summer. I said, oh, hold it. No, no. No, no. And the kind of deal I had, they didn't have the right to move it. Everything with Paramount and I were mutually agreed upon with a handshake that happened in 1956 when Dina and I split, Paramount and I shook hands, and I had the most lucrative picture deal in the history of the universe. Mm -hmm. I never once had to ask them anything. So, where was I? Oh, we're talking about... So, Barney says we want to do that in, at, uh, in the summer. Of I said, film, right? Yeah, I said, Barney, look, the film was dictated to be the summer. I want to keep it that way. I'll give you a Jerry movie in July. He said, you got it. You shook my hand, and I left. What month was this? This was January 15th. So, you had six months... To write, shoot, and cut. No, no, no. January 15th, I arrived that night at the Fonda Blue Hotel, and I sat down at the typewriter, and I wrote a 165-page screenplay in nine days. On the 10th day, I had the flights coming in from Los Angeles with my crew, technical, editing, and everything else. And by February the 9th, 
I called the role for the first take. And we shot for 36 days. I moved the crew, company, everybody from where we were in Florida to Las Vegas because I had to play the sand. So I was editing the bellboy in the musician's room of the sands. Oh. And we cut the picture in seven weeks. We got it done. And on May 17th, the bellboy was delivered to every film exchange in the world. And for those that don't know, you don't say a word in that movie. No. Which Not I until the last uh, astounding. 15 seconds. And, um, and Paramount didn't want to go with what they called a silent movie. So Barney calls me and said, Jerry, we have a problem with being a, a silent movie. I said, Barney, tell them to read the script right. I can, I can only tell you that if you don't believe what I believe, it's okay. I'll go it alone. And he said, fine. So I paid for the picture. It cost me $997,000. What, what do you mean you paid for the picture? I paid for everything. I made the picture. Because the studio was afraid of it? They walked away. I said, fine, my company will do it. We did. To date, I have had over $300 million in returns on that negative when tickets were a quarter. I can't thank you enough. You know, yes, you can. Start now. Right. The other day when I was imagining <laughs> This is my dream, sitting with uh, JL, who, uh, when I was a little boy, I looked exactly like Jerry. I had a crew cut, I did all your bits, I tell you this. And my mother was very physical, she used to beat me up a lot. But, once in a while, if I could do a Jerry Lewis bit, she'd laugh and not hit me. So you saved me a lot of ass kicking. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> the, great, the great Jerry Lewis, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve.